if you train in a martial art, you can imagine maybe someday you'll be in a fight. But if you're training to run, you're never going to need to run 10 miles to save somebody's life as much as I wish it were otherwise. So I used to think of my hobby as being somewhat useless. But then I discovered that the discipline and practice of running helps people deal with real problems in the real world. This is Running For Real, the podcast for runners who know that for every runner's high, there are just as many lows. All those just missed PRs, easy runs that feel hard, injury blues, and more. Each week, we'll talk to running, health, and wellness experts about their highs, lows, and best advice to build our confidence. Running For Real is about being honest, being brave, and most of all, not feeling alone. And now here's our host, Tina Muir. Hello, my friends. Welcome to episode number 128 of the Running Thrill podcast. Thank you so much for being here today. I am really excited about this episode today. This is a guest I've been thinking about for years. I just couldn't figure out how to get to him because he is just so well known. But first, I want to tell you about last week. Did you listen to that episode with Hayley Caruthers and Dan Robinson? Hayley was the girl that kind of captured the heart of the British nation, definitely. But I know her photos uh, ended up going all over the running world with the pictures of her crawling across the finish line at the London Marathon. But as you learned last week, her story went so much further than just that race. She only started running like ever, ever running uh, for the first time in 2016. And now she's a 2.33 marathoner, a 71 minute half marathoner has broken 16 minutes in a 5k and just has an impressive resume going on. Now, I mentioned to you today that I'm really excited about this guest. And today we have Peter Sagal, who hosts the Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me podcast, which is hosted by NPR. Massive podcast, probably one of the most well-known podcasts. And he's also an avid runner. He's talked about that a lot. He wrote the Incomplete Book of Running, which you're going to hear a lot about today. And actually where the idea came from because uh, I didn't actually know until I did the research that the book he wrote is actually a spin-off of a previous version of uh, a running book that he explained to me was essentially the one of the kickstarts of the running boom, which was really interesting to hear. But Peter is very honest. He's very funny, as I'm sure many of you know, but he's also very honest. He doesn't mind talking about the hard things. He's talked about his struggle with depression. He's talked about a lot of the things that other people aren't afraid to talk about. We also talk about his career, where it's come from, how his podcast started. Well, it still is a radio show and it's just a fantastic conversation with just such a great guy. There's a lot of laughs in this episode. We start off on a bit of a fun note, so you will get to hear all about that. And I'm really looking forward to hearing what you think about this. Now, all we are going to do is give a big shout out and thank you to our sponsors, Athletic Greens and Metro, and we will be right to the episode. Peter, thank you so much for joining me today on the Running Thrill podcast. Honestly, I've been trying to get you on the show for years and I can't even believe that I'm speaking with you. Um, so <laughs> thank you so much for being here. Well, I was playing hard to get. Yeah. I figured it would be more sweet when you finally got me. So okay, well, that's nice. Because I actually have, in England, we would say, I have some beef with you. I don't know if you use that term in... Well, we English. do, but I don't know what it means like, in, in your We idiom. have something that we need to kind of deal with, oh, which you, is... You, you, have, you have a beef. We have a beef. I didn't realize. Mm. I'm, I, if I had known, perhaps I would have avoided you more. But tell me what your no, beef no, no. is. It was a recent it, thing. So when I was recent. researching to kind of ask, ask you some questions on here... I saw you making a massive insult and everyone was agreeing with, or not agreeing with me because I didn't say anything, but you made a massive dig at deep dish pizza in Chicago. Ah, yes. And I... So you don't have a beef with me. You have a lake of cheese with me. I, that's true. That's true. Okay. I, you know, it's one of my favorite meals in the world. Mm -hmm. that, like massive pie of a pizza. Yeah. And uh, I just, I want you to clear that up because you called it a cheese casserole, which... As it people is. said, I don't see that as an insult particularly, but what is it with a deep dish pizza that, All right. you know, you, you really you want, this, this is where, you, you're all right. You want to throw down. Um, <laughs> where, where are you from? Let me ask, let me start here. Where are you from? I mean, you can't tell. I can tell, but where exactly? <laughs> well, I'm from England, but I lived in Michigan for five years. So I was close to Chicago. Right. Okay. So you're from England. Mm -hmm. And is there anything in your view that tourists to England do? That's really dumb. Like, for example, do they come and demand to have like cream tea or maybe even worse, kidney pie? 
and you're like, nobody eats kidney pie. You've been reading Harry Potter too much. It's terrible. It tastes vaguely like pee. Please stay away from it. Or black pudding, I think, would probably black be Black pudding. It. Yes. Or spotted dick, perhaps. Yes. We have all these that we tourists who come to England have all these notions about what's good. Mm. And you're like, no, don't do that, because we have so many things that are better than that awful thing that you found out about reading in Harry Potter, (laughs) for example. Mm -hmm. So so, so the the, the familiar, the concept is familiar to you of the dumb tourist thing. Yes. That's what deep dish pizza is. Nobody here, like nobody here actually eats deep dish pizza, except for my wife. My wife, by the way, I want you to know, disagrees with me. She likes deep dish. She grew up here and I, I did not. I only lived here for 20 years. Here's the problem with deep dish pizza. It's generally just cheese. It's a <laughs> lot of cheese. With like a it's pie crust. Even, it's not, it's cheese and pie crust <laughs> and cheese and pie crust are good things, but perhaps not in that amount. I mean, you're from Europe. Europe has cheese. You have a little bit of cheese. You have a cheddar or a, or a, or whatever British cheese I can't think of right now, Winsleydale, as yeah. uh, as 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 Wallace likes to say, um, and you. But you don't eat like two pounds of industrially processed faux cheddar at once, That's do you? True. That's, That's just gross. That's insulting, I think. Actually, it is. Yeah. It's just like uh, it's just milk fat and tomato sauce and crust. When Chicago is one of the great food cities in America, That's if true. not. Because like all great food cities, it has this incredible sort of melange of immigrant traditions that you can get legitimately. We have great Mexican food and Asian food. We have great Eastern European food, which is rare in American cities. Mm. But we also have these wonderful native foods that are so much better than deep dish. For example, an Italian beef sandwich Mm. is another Chicago specialty. That is a thousand times better than a deep dish pizza. Or uh, if you want to get even weird or a Chicago dog, which I love. And keep in mind, these things are terrible for you. I'm not being all high and mighty about the health benefits Mm -hmm. of eating deep dish. I'm saying that if you're going to waste a meal on a 2000 calorie Chicago tradition, there are better choices than deep dish. Thank you for listening to my TED talk. I no, no, what you're no, no. To... It, was, it, it was persuasive. And I think I will reconsider whenever people say they're going to Chicago, that being the first thing coming out of my mouth to tell them yeah. to go to. Um, but I guess it is kind of like, you know, when you go to a restaurant, you think I want to get something that I couldn't make at home because right. why am I going out to eat if I'm getting a grilled cheese that I could make exactly. myself? Okay, That's, so. And I completely agree with that. But mm-hmm. first of all, you can get deep dish pizza frozen and in chains all over the country now. Chicago style pizza. And secondly, it's just not worth it. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'm just saying. All right. I'll, I'll, I'll give it to you there. And uh, I, we can settle this today and I'll forgive you. <laughs> Thank you. Our beef is now resolved. Yes. Okay. So for those who do not know you, I would imagine most people listening do. Um, but you are kind of known right now as the host of Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, a podcast which smokes mine on um <laughs> on any kind of rankings but you know you have do... been at it longer don't get too yes. upset so on that note you know from what i read uh, you know wait wait don't tell me started in 1998 it did so were podcasts even was that even a no. thing or you was it something else we, we, we were and weirdly still are a radio show mm-hmm. heard of those <laughs> i have <laughs> yes <laughs> We, we, uh, it's amazing. I feel like, uh, like, well, when I was a boy, we didn't have podcasts. Why? We had to listen to the radio when it was on. And if yeah. we missed it, we missed it. And we liked it. Yep. But that's, yeah, we are an NPR show. We're still on the radio. Okay. Uh, still, most of our listeners, although the proportion keeps, as you can imagine, changing in favor of casting, but most of our listeners are live radio listeners, people who tune in at 10 a.m. on Saturday or 11 on Sunday, whenever it's locally broadcast. And one of the nice things about uh, our show is that a lot of people tell me that we're kind of appointment listening, meaning, oh, yes, every Saturday morning at 10, everybody knows not to bother me. I'm listening to Wait, Wait. Or even better, uh, we always time our trips to soccer practice so me and my daughter can listen. And I love that. Um, There's something, I mean, the nice things about podcasts is that you can listen to it whenever you like. Mm -hmm. And you can listen to it while you're on a run, although I don't recommend it. You can listen to it while you're doing errands or whatever. The nice thing about radio is that sometimes it can be something you enjoy with other people at the same time, Mm -hmm. be those people in your house uh, or more broadly, just everybody listening all at once. And I think that kind of communal activity is underrated. I mean, 
to change topics for a second, uh, the whole Game of Thrones frenzy these last couple of years has been about the quality and interest in the show, but it's also been about how much fun it is to have everybody watching something at the same time. Absolutely. I'm not going to say that Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me has the same rabid fan base, but I'm going to say that that aspect of it, I think, is still important. I absolutely agree. I mean, one of my favorite memories from being in high school was uh, a group of us, with maybe six or seven, would gather to watch Lost every week. Um, exactly. Yeah. And I remember it being like, we got to, you know, like you said, it's an appointment. Lost is on at whatever time yeah. it was, seven, and we cannot miss it. And, and I quite enjoyed that. And, you know, I, I think that's great. And, and I also like that it's, you know, it's an update on kind of things that have happened in the week. So you can kind of not watch the news and feel depressed every day watching it. Yes. You can kind of catch up on... Um... Yeah, and then feel depressed for an hour when you listen to my <laughs> show. It makes sense. It's more efficient. There you go. I do actually quite like, I don't know if you like him at all, but um, I quite like Last Week Tonight with John Oliver. Oh, and he's great. what I kind of feel like I catch up on what's going on in the world. Um, and uh, so, yeah, it's kind of a similar thing and like watching it with other people. Although obviously with that one, it has to be a certain type of humor to, yes. <laughs> to like that yeah. one. Um, okay. So, you know, you've just told us a little bit about there where it, you know, started, uh, as I said, 1998. So going quite a while now, um, which yeah. is great, but 21 years. Yes. That's impressive. Yes. For those who haven't listened, you know, we've kind of given a bit of uh, a clue, but why should someone listen if they don't already? To wait, wait, don't tell me. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, <laughs> I mean, what we like to say about wait, wait, don't tell me is it's a public radio without the dignity. Uh, obviously we're on public radio, we're an NPR show. And that means a couple of things. Uh, it means that we are the one hour a week when public radio sort of, uh, I was about to say, let's, it's, let's, it's guard down. I almost said, let's, it's pants down. Both are true. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we're sort of the goofy uncle of NPR, the guy who shows up and just cracks everybody up, but then you're kind of glad he leaves so you can get back to your life. That's us. Okay. So if, if if you're somebody who listens to public radio all week for the news, for the commentary, for the cultural reporting, for the important stuff you need to be a good and um, and 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 a loyal citizen to this republic, uh, we're the guys who come along and make fart noises to give you a little break, and then you can go back to it afterwards. Yep, and it is very fun. I definitely recommend giving it a listen. I will have links in the show notes if you haven't already uh, checked it out. All right. So moving on, you have, you know, quite an incredible list of uh, accomplishments on your huh. resume or should we say on your Wikipedia? Because that's yeah, realistically that, where it that's a from. funny story. Mm -hmm. Briefly put. So yeah. about two years ago, we had an intern in the office who said to me, oh, wow, your Wikipedia page is really long. And I said, no, it isn't, because the last time I had checked it, which was maybe a year before, it was just two paragraphs. And she said, no, it really is. And I went and it had gone from like two short paragraphs. Peter Sagal's a radio host. He wrote this. He's from here to this like mm -hmm. intensely detailed examination of my entire life. And I was very shocked and a little creeped out. But it turns out that there's this group of people, they may have a name, who their hobby is to go through Wikipedia, find short articles that they feel should be longer and do them as a project. So some guy, I believe he lives in the central coast of California. I tried to track him down because I wondered who might it be, but he doesn't know me. He just looked my, looked at my Wikipedia page and said, Peter Sagal needs a longer entry. And so apparently spent like a week of his time or however long it took researching everything he could about huh. my life. And was and it creating, true? But it's all true. And it's a little terrifying <laughs> yeah. to know how much information is available yeah. about there's he that guy never called me he never contacted me to fact check me he just got it all right from sort of publicly available sources and that's terrifying yeah but that i is. guess gratifying i don't know yeah. anyway yeah well i guess that saved you you know being uh, sitting there for hours on end having to answer all these questions at least he's done the work for you but yeah i totally get that seems that seems a bit strange. And you mentioned they had a name. What is it? What, the Wikipedians uh, or something? I don't know. Note? I mean, there's, I mean, there's, there's people who, who work on Reddit as Redditors. Okay. Uh, so I assume that there's a phrase or a word for these people who just are amateur Wikipedia enthusiasts. <laughs> nice. I like that. So, you know, it's okay. a thought. Right. So, you know, uh, on that note, so we said playwright, screenwriter, TV yep. writer, actor, you played yourself in things, including The Simpsons, which is impressive in itself. Yes. Journalist, author, and then this host of a podcast. 
Yes, that's so more or less it. I've I've done a, a I've done a little bit of a lot of things, mm-hmm. uh, some of which didn't work out at all, but I got to do them. So uh, yeah, I'd love to kind of dig into that a bit. So looking back now, for those who think, oh, your career just kind of fell into your lap. That's the dream ah. to have any of those. You know, I if I could be one of those things, I would just be so happy. What what would you say to those people who kind of think, you know, it just kind of fell into place for you? Well, uh, the, 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 the sad thing is it kind of did. Okay. And, and what I mean by that is, you know, the main thing I'm known for and the thing that brought me a lot of those other things, for example, playing myself on the Simpsons was the radio show. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's pretty much what I'm known for. It's provided, shall we say a steady income and a platform to do other things. So without the radio show, who knows? And I literally got the radio show because I got a phone call one day from somebody saying, Hey, you want to be part of this new radio show? Wow. That was it. And I said, yes. Thank you to Athletic Greens for sponsoring this episode of the Running For Real podcast. Athletic Greens is the ultimate daily all-in-one supplement that comes in a tasty green powder. You just put one scoop into a glass of water, into a shaker, give it a shake, give it a stir and just drink it down. I like to put it with 14 ounces so I can start my day off with a glass of water and 75 proven vitamins, minerals and whole food source ingredients. It includes prebiotics and probiotics. It is just a wonderful product. Tim Ferriss calls it his all-in-one nutritional insurance and I kind of feel the same way. That is a wonderful way of describing it and it's just easy to fit in your schedule. And speaking of fitting it in, you can get 20 free Athletic Greens travel packs valued at $79 with your first purchase. All you need to do is go to athleticgreens.com forward slash Tina. Those 20 travel packs, you can test them out when you're on the road. You can take them with you when you are traveling this summer with your family. Because usually when we're on vacation, we do not make the best best choices with our food. And that's okay. It's all right to let loose and have fun. But still make sure you're keeping your body in a good place, giving it, it the supplements, the nutrition that it needs. Go to athleticgreens.com forward slash Tina. I absolutely love it. And I think you will too. You know, the main thing I'm known for and the thing that brought me a lot of those other things, for example, playing myself on The Simpsons was the radio show. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's pretty much what I'm known for. It's provided, shall we say, a steady income and a platform to do other things. So without the radio show, who knows? And I literally got the radio show because I got a phone call one day from somebody saying, hey, you want to be part of this new radio show? Wow. That was it. And I said, yes. What were you doing at that point? I was working as a playwright and screenwriter, freelance, and I was doing okay. Uh, I mean, as you or your listeners might know, that's a hard business, Mm. both those things, the theater and the entertainment industry. And so the fact that I was actually making a living, if you know, not rocketing to stardom, uh, I think is impressive. I I, I pat myself on the back here. I'll do it on Skype. (laughs) But certainly... And the people I knew from that industry, for example, the person who made that phone call was a theater director I knew. So I guess you can all go back and say, well, I did this and did this because, you know, the flap of a butterfly's wings changes history. But the fact of the matter is I am the luckiest guy you will ever talk to because if that phone hadn't rung, who knows where I'd be. But it did ring. I said, sure. I was cast. I mean, after I'm skipping a bit here, but I was cast as part of a panel of this new radio show called Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me that was launching in early 1998, uh, I was on the panel. As people who know our show know, there's the host, myself these days, in the panel. Uh, initially, I was on the panel. And uh, shortly after that, was offered a chance to be the host. And I said, sure, that'll be fun for a while. And 21 uh, years later, here I am talking to you. And has it remained fun? Is there, is there any part of it that does kind of feel like, ugh? Well, I, you know, yes and no. I mean, it, it is fun. It's always fun. Uh, if anybody, I mean, because what I get to do every week is put on a show with my friends, mm-hmm. which is, you know, Andy Rooney's dream to use a cultural reference. You may not get, Hey guys, let's put on a show. Uh, we do it in front of a live audience, uh, sometimes very large live audiences, uh, sometimes very small, intimate live audiences, but it's always fun. And one of the things about facing a live audience every week is it really focuses your attention. It's like being shot at. Uh, So, you know, every week I sit around with my friends who I work with and we come up with funny things to do and talk about. And then we fly in other friends who form our panel. We get to talk about those things, see what happens. And of course, I get to interview a very interesting person. So it doesn't suck. There have been times when, you know, you're looking at the, the week's news and you're like, oh, my God. 
what are we going to say this week? You know, just like, because oh, there's we so much or because there's not there's really so much. much. I mean, it's weird. I mean, everything I might have said about doing a weekly news quiz prior to 2015 and the rise of Donald Trump is no longer the case. Our challenges are different now. Mm. Challenge used to be, for example, and sometimes it was hard to come up with stuff to talk about because, you know, in a normal week and, you know, in America, not a lot of crazy stuff happens, especially, you know, in terms of the most prominent people in the federal government during the Obama years, you know, for example, uh, it was hard to say, well, you know, what are we going to, what, what are we going to make jokes about some new, you know, irrigation initiative they just mm. announced? Oh my God. And then Donald Trump came down that escalator in the summer of 2015. And ever since that moment, the the challenge has been not a week, what are we going to talk about, but how are we going to talk about this this week? How much, and by this, I mean the, the, the avalanche of insanity that is coming at us every day. Mm-hmm. Um, which of these are we going to talk about? How much of this does our audience want us to want us to talk about? When would they want us to stop talking about it and move on to something else? Mm-hmm. And we've been negotiating that, well, for five years now, almost four years coming up. And it's tricky. It's it's like all challenges. It's uh, it's kind of exciting and ch- challenging. It, it captures your attention, but it's also exhausting. Yeah, you know. But one of the things we know is that our audience is exhausted too. Our audience is, our audience, the public radio listening audience, is also subject to this cavalcade of news. They're people who pay attention to the news. And when they get to us on the weekend, remember we talked about like that time slot. Oh my God, if we can just get to Saturday at 10, we can listen to Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, people tell me. Well, what do they want to hear when we get there? They may want us to hear us saying the things they've been thinking all week about the president of the United States. Oh my God, can you believe this guy? But they also want us to talk about other things that are fun, interesting, that that they haven't had the mental space to even think about because they've been so worried about what's been going on with everything. So that challenge has been, it's been, you know, it's made us both focused on what we do in a way we hadn't been before. It's made us both dedicated to what we do in a way we weren't before because so many people talk to us about how much they need us. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's just exhausting. Yeah. And do you ever have weeks where, you know, maybe a lot of things have happened and you say, okay, I'm going to focus on this this week, but then you get closer and you kind of sensing that people need a break from it. Well, yeah. I mean, uh, we work on our show on a weekly schedule where we sort of every day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, we tape on Thursday nights where we're talking about what are we going to feature? And there have been many times when something will happen on Tuesday. That's so insane. That's so crazy that we're like, well, obviously that has to be the lead of our show. You know, uh, Donald Trump just, you know, ate a live puppy. Oh my God. Well, we have to go with the puppy. Let's talk about the puppy. And then Wednesday, you know, he'll, he'll like, he'll, he'll set fire to the West wing. And so, well, we got to talk about that. And then Thursday, right before the show, you know, he'll, he'll be running around naked in the Rose garden, you know, painted blue. And we're like, well, we should, what should we, should we stick with the, should we stick with a fire in the West wing or should we go to the painted blue? And, and, and sometimes we even have to say, well, what is he going to do tomorrow? Mm-hmm. If we go with the latest thing, which is running around painted blue, are we going to miss the thing that's probably going to happen? So it, it's, yeah. it's absolutely an ongoing, almost like I don't, again, because you're British, you may not have grown up with this, but do you remember the, you ever heard of the I Love Lucy show? I've heard of it. I have not watched it. Okay. The I Love Lucy show was a famous sitcom uh, from the 1950s. It was one of the first big American sitcoms. Mm -hmm. And it's mainly physical humor because of the the lead. So it, it, it keeps up in a way that other comedies don't. When we're done with this, I want you to Google Lucy Ethel Chocolates. Ethel? Yeah, Lucy. That's her. There's Lucy. Her best friend is named Ethel, and they get a job in a chocolate factory. And it's an incredibly classic gag that most Americans remember, in which these two people have the job of wrapping chocolates as they come down a conveyor belt. Mm -hmm. You're supposed to pick up the chocolate, wrap it, put it over here. Pick up the chocolate, wrap it over here. And the entire gag is more and more chocolates keep coming down, and the comedy is about how desperate they keep up trying to wrap up all the chocolates, this parade of chocolates, Mm -hmm. this avalanche of chocolates. 
that's sort of what our job is. Anybody <laughs> who talks about the Trump era, except it's not chocolate. Yeah. Okay. I get that. <laughs> Probably quite the opposite. Uh, but great. Thank you for explaining that. I will definitely go look that up. And uh, it's interesting to kind of hear the backstory of it. And and just there, you you were honest with us. You kind of told us the inner thoughts of your mind, which I appreciate. You know, not everyone is going to do that. So thank you for sharing that. And I did tell you before we started this interview that I have not read your book, which we are going to talk about in a few minutes, um, The Incomplete Book of Running. But friends that have read it have said that you are really honest in the book about some challenges that you have, you know, depression, struggling with eating, body image. Now, those topics in particular, now you are a public figure, you know, how easy was it to have the courage to speak out about them, knowing that people were probably going to criticize you and it would add to those insecurities that you might already have? Well, what's interesting, let me, let me put it this way. Uh, that wasn't a challenge. Mm. In fact, in, in making the book, a lot of the changes I had to make on the advice of editor and friends was to say less uh, about certain incidents and events. Uh, I don't know why that is. I can tell you that a very, a, an important part of the book was a podcast I did. The podcast was called The Hilarious World of Depression. And let me try to explain what happened. So I got a contract from Simon and Schuster to write a book about running because I'm a fairly successful amateur midlife runner, run a bunch of marathons, whatever. Yep. And then after I agreed to write the book, which was going to be a breezy midlife, you know, hey, everybody, you know, run your way through your midlife crisis. Everybody hears Peter Sagal about that with some jokes. A bunch of things happened. One of which was the bombing at the Boston Marathon in 2013. I was there. I was 100 yards away from the bombs. I had just finished the race. So that was a big deal. Mm -hmm. And the second was my marriage ended in a just an absolutely catastrophic way. And shall we say, presented me with some challenges. And I came to understand that if I was going to write this book, I, I had to talk about that mm -hmm. as much as, you know, when you should eat your energy gel during a marathon. Uh, I had to talk about that because it was all, it seemed to me, and I ended up being, I think, correct about this, related. You know, I was going to be talking about my life as a runner. Well, you need to talk about your life. All right, so I'm going to do that. How do I do that? And one of the things that really helped me decide how to go about doing this was when I was invited, actually, I volunteered by my, fr uh, by my friend John Moe, who's a radio guy, writer in Minneapolis, who was starting this podcast called The Hilarious World of Depression. And I wanted to talk about some of the things that I had been dealing with. And John sort of invited me to do it and to try it out as a sort of like a test case. Is it, was this going to work? And one of the things I found out was that doing that is scary to talk about your struggles, to talk about whatever. And as you said, you're afraid of what people are going to say. You're afraid people are going to think poorly of you. You're going to afraid people are going to think of you as being ill somehow. And that fear of stigma, I think, keeps a lot of people from speaking. Yep. But the actual experience I had was precisely the opposite. Instead, and, to, and by the way, that podcast came out, I think, two years ago, maybe three. It's hard to remember. And I still, one episode of a podcast, two, three years ago, people still come up to me literally every week and thank me for doing it. Mm -hmm. Because it turns out that if someone like me, who has some prominence in the culture, you know, I'm not a movie star, but I'm somebody whose name people knows. If I go out there and I say, hey, these are the things I've been struggling with and this is what it's like, people who are struggling with the same thing, and a lot are, mm -hmm. find it comforting. Yep. And they find it encouraging to know, first of all, that they're not alone, to know that somebody and to be, you know, somebody who they might admire, say, well, as you said, you know, when this, oh, Peter Sagal, look at all the stuff he's done. Well, to know that I've done all that stuff while still struggling with the same things that everybody else struggles with makes them feel better about themselves. Some people have told me that my conversation about it helped them go get help, make a decision to seek therapy or to talk about it more, or whatever they needed to do. And that's extremely gratifying. So when I sat down to write the book, finally, I felt that not only did I want to do some of the same things, but that I could. Mm -hmm. And again, the response has been terrific. 
for example, you talk about uh, one of the things I write about is body image and my struggle with it. You would be amazed how many men have thanked me directly or not for bringing up that subject because a lot of men deal with it and men never talk about it. They feel ashamed, Mm -hmm. you know, one advantage. I mean, and I always say this when we get into this topic that men deal with a tiny infinitesimal fraction of the pressures of body image and adhering to an ideal that women do. That said, men worry about it too and are ashamed to talk about it. This podcast is brought to you by MetPro. MetPro is a world-renowned concierge nutrition, fitness, and lifestyle coaching company. Using metabolic profiling, MetPro's team of experts analyze your metabolism and provide an individualized approach to obtaining your goals. Now, what does that mean? If you are someone who has heard me talking about, you know, eating by feel, that you should eat when you're hungry, stop when you're full, and that will work for you. That got my period back that, you know, it works for me and it's, it's great, but I understand that that has been very frustrating for a lot of you listening. Um, you've mentioned to me specifically that that doesn't work for you. Maybe you feel like you're, you're barely eating or you're trying to eat 1500, 1200 calories a day and you're running, or maybe you're eating 2000, you're running and it just, you still seem to be gaining weight. You still don't seem to be getting anywhere. You feel stuck. I've heard this from you again and again, and it breaks my heart. But I think this might be the solution for you. Now, I mentioned initially that I actually turned this company away because I wasn't sure it was a good fit. But after I spoke to them, I I had so many of your faces in my mind, the things you've been telling me you've been struggling with. And I really think this could be the platform that helps you finally make the change. Now, MetPro is giving Running For Real listeners a complimentary metabolic profiling assessment and a 30-minute consultation with a MetPro expert. You can claim this offer by heading to metpro.co forward slash Tina. That is M-E-T-P-R-O dot C-O forward slash Tina. Go do it. You know, we are often talking about how we train to run our best to go get these goals. But especially if your goal is performance or your goal is to just have a healthier lifestyle, this is going to help you reach that goal and it's going to really change your life. So go find it. Go to metpro.co forward slash Tina. One of the things I write about is body image and my struggle with it. You would be amazed how many men have thanked me directly or not for bringing up that subject because a lot of men deal with it and men never talk about it. They feel ashamed. Mm -hmm. One advantage, I mean, and I always say this when we get into this topic, that men deal with a tiny infinitesimal fraction of the pressures of body image and adhering to an ideal that women do. That said, men worry about it too and are ashamed to talk about it. And so I'm talking about it and people are going, like one interview that I did for the book was like, that's all the guy wanted to talk about. And you could tell that that's something he had thought about and struggled with and was so grateful that I had brought it up. So that's been the reaction. Absolutely. Now, all that said, kind of have to be careful with what you say. In my case, I had issues with my family that I just couldn't get into because I have children, they have their own lives. And I uh, felt ultimately that I, I I mean, I I struggled with how much I could say about what happened. uh, And I eventually decided the answer was nothing. Uh, So there's a, a lot of people have said, you really talk about what actually happened. And I'm like, that's exactly right. Because it is my business, but it's also the business of my uh, children. And I just, I, I just can't betray their, what, what, their privacy. Let's just say that. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I definitely get that on mine's a, a much smaller scale, but um, you obviously don't know this, but most of the reason that people know of me is because I actually spoke out about body image and same thing. Like I was an elite runner and I didn't have a period for nine years. That was, you know, where most people came from, but I've actually also spoken out a lot about how you know, men have it pretty tough because like you said, you do go, like men do experience it as well, but they, you know, it's easy. It's not easy for a woman, but it's definitely easier to kind of say it than, than, a, than a man. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm glad to hear that you did kind of speak out because I think you're absolutely right. And there's a lot of people listening right now who, who feel that same comfort by you even just saying it right here and, and now they can read your book and, and, 
get into it even more. But had you not done that podcast, The Hilarious World of Depression, which I'll put a link in the show notes to that episode, do you think you would have addressed those topics? Uh, I wouldn't have known how. Mm. Um, and, and this is something I credit John Moe with as his producer of Chrissy Pease, because I talked to them for like two hours. Mm. And then when I heard the edit, what they chose to broadcast, they were so careful to make sure that, that the way, when I ended up speaking about it on the air, and of course, in order to talk about this, you kind of have to like, you know, just vomit it all out. Yeah. But they presented a version of what I was saying. It was all honest. It was all true, but it, it was the right approach. And one of the things that you need to do when you talk about this is, is you need to focus on yourself as opposed to the people who you might blame for this. It's, it's a very tricky dance. Yeah. You know, we've all, I think, heard podcasts, especially with the internet. It's so confessional. There's something about talking about your problems that other, that's both very attractive to other people but can be also upsetting to other people, or I don't know what the right word is. It can push them away if you don't do it the right way. You have to present it. It's a tough balance between taking responsibility, between feeling self-pity and being self-aware, between understanding what happened to you in terms of what other people might have done to you mm -hmm. and blaming them. And, and navigating that is really, really hard. And, and there's, you know, there's traps on either side. We've all had the experience of listening to somebody say, well, you know, I was a subject of abuse. And, and then you're like, you know, after a while you're listening to them, you're going, you know, you really, you have to take some responsibility to what happened. And it's not easy, but I, I hope I managed it correctly. So, so far, I think that from the reaction I've gotten, I managed yeah. to thread the needle. Seems to be the case from what I've, everything I've read, all the reviews, you know, really, really found it helpful. And so on that note, for someone who it kind of is in that stage right now where they're feeling, you know, a bit, a bit like the world has done them injustice, things all went wrong for me. What would be your advice? You mentioned therapy. Anything else? Well, I mean, it's really tough. And I've had to think about it because uh, I know somebody who's going through, I'm, I'm close with somebody who's going through a crisis like this now, sort of what I went through. And, you know, when you have to come up with actual advice and I think, you know, my advice is this, and it actually comes from running. In the end, the book became an examination and a discussion of how my hobby of running, which I thought had no real purpose except to accumulate, you know, metals dang for my doorknob. I mean, nobody needs to run, right? I mean, like, if you train in a martial art, you can imagine maybe someday you'll be in a fight. But if you're training to run, you're never going to need to run 10 miles to like, you know, save somebody's life as much as I wish it were otherwise. So I used to think of my hobby as being somewhat useless, but then I discovered when I thought about it, that the, the persistence and the, rather the discipline and practice of running helps people deal with real problems in the real world. So for example, one of the things I would say is to modify some classic running advice, which is run the mile you're in, right? Everybody knows this. Ryan Hall just wrote a book with that title. Yes. <laughs> And what that means is, is that if you're, you know, starting out a marathon or a half marathon and the first mile sucks, you're never going to get through it. If you just keep thinking about, oh my God, I got to run 12 more of these or 25 more of these. This is going to be awful. No, the, the thing you need to do is to say, okay, where am I right now? What do I got to do right now? What do I got to do to get to the mile marker? Am, am I feeling terrible? All right, work with that. Do I need to stop? No. Okay. What do I need to keep going? And that ends up being a very useful mindset for dealing with any kind of crisis yeah. in that what's happening right now, somebody is doing you wrong. Well, deal with that uh, as best you can. It won't go on forever. And the idea that I, what I end up calling the practice of persistence, one of the things that long distance runners learn is that we can get through things. All of us. Uh, from the elites to the average weekly jogger, I've had terrible runs. Mm -hmm. But most of us don't quit when it gets hard. We slow down, we stop and get a drink, we stretch, and we keep going. And that mindset, more than anything, helped me get through what I was dealing with, and I think can help other people. That we have a tendency to take an immediate terrible thing and extrapolate into the future. Mm -hmm. This is going to be awful forever. No, it won't. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Seriously, it won't. 
uh, you know, unless you're dealing, of course, with, you know, a crippling injury. But even then, I think the people who successfully deal with that are the people who are able to say, okay, now what? How do I keep going? Yeah, I love that. Great advice. And uh, and so true it is running is such a such a parallel for life. And actually, um, a few months ago now, I had a podcast um, series with uh, psychologists, performance coaches, and um, Josh Leifrak, who um, is the uh, mental skills director for the Chicago Cubs. He and you, you passionate about Chicago? Um, I, I do love Chicago. Yeah. I'm not a Cubs fan. I need to be honest. Okay. I'm a Boston Red Sox fan. We have to be loyal. Okay, that's on. true. I, I did know you were a Red Sox. Uh, but he was saying um, about how, you know, running is so different or runners are so different in that, you know, it could be raining, it could be terrible weather, it, you could feel terrible, but you just find a way to get through it. You find right. a way to make it through whatever you had planned for the day, unless obviously if you have an injury or something that yeah. is, you know, not smart to do, but runners find a way of getting through it. Whereas yeah. other people might say, you know what, it's just not happening today. I'm just going to back out. So um, that reminded me of that when you were just talking about that. So I want to talk about a bit about your running. Um, firstly, just kind of using this as a segue between what we were talking about. You mentioned running helped you kind of deal with things and it was a great parallel for life, essentially. But did running ever, this is a question from Richard, by the way, did running ever feel like it was allowing you to kind of feel like you were doing something about these challenges but really just kind of masking it, a way of kind of getting through the day, but not actually facing it because you're like, oh, well, I'm processing it through my run, kind of masking well, it. Well, I, I would say yes, but what's wrong with that? Mm. Uh, in other words, I mean, th there were days in, in the darkest period of my own crisis where, you know, other than my morning run, I didn't get anything else done. I didn't, I, I just lay there and, and helplessly as events washed over me but at least I got a run in. Yeah. And if I hadn't, what would have my day been like? My day would have been like lying on my bed, staring at my ceiling in disbelief of what was happening and a feeling of absolute helplessness to stop it. Well, you could do that or you could go for a run. And, uh, while going for a run didn't solve my problems, didn't give me, you know, I didn't like come up with a way to, you know, deal with whatever during my run. At least I went for a run. That's true. And I think given the, the two choices, lying there all day, except and lying there all day, except for the hour you were outside running, I think we'd all choose the latter, right? Yeah. And what gave you the, I don't know, confidence or the push to, to take it to the next step going beyond just the running being the one thing? Well, I mean, it depends. Uh, you know, it, all I can say is that one of the things that I learned, and this comes directly from running is that this, as I think I said before, like this will end. Mm. Uh, this is what I was going through was miserable. Uh, it was a nightmare, but I knew that it would end mm -hmm. just like every miserable run I've been on has ended. I'm not still out there in the rain on Lakeshore drive and that freezing day that was just horrendous. That was so awful that even though it happened eight years ago, my friends and I still talk about it. It ended. We got home. We took a shower, we dried off, we warmed up and, and knowing that helped me get through it. Mm, and, okay. you know, even because there's a, as I think I've said before, there's a tendency when you're, when you're down in the depths to think that you will never get out. And that in fact is one of the hallmarks of depression mm -hmm. is the loss of perspective. I.e. I'm feeling miserable now. I will always feel miserable. This will never end. Yeah. And one thing we know from running is yes, it will. Yeah. It, it actually will. That's true the things that you want to happen may not happen, but it will change. Mm -hmm. Something else will happen. Yep. And if you just hang out long enough, circumstances will change. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you for explaining that. Um, now <laughs> you mentioned about things ending with, with running and, uh, tough days. So you started running around 15, running with your father, then somewhere along the way, lost the passion, lost the ability to run something and didn't run again till 40, you know, what happened in that time? Well, more, more or less, I didn't run seriously till okay. I was 40. Okay. And so you were running the entire time. I was jogging, you know, okay. I would go out. I mean, it was, I think it's a pretty typical story that I was a runner in high school, not a very good one, but a dedicated one. I was out there doing, you know, I did my first half marathon, did a lot of 10 Ks. 
But then I went off to college, and college was overwhelming, and it was hard to find the time, although I would occasionally go out and, and, and go for runs up and down the river. And then I got out of college, and I you know, just tried to make my way as a writer, and I, I tried to keep it up. Uh, there were various obstacles. I was living in L.A. In L.A., the air is terrible, so it was tough mm-hmm. to run. And then eventually I got married and got a job. And, you know, uh, I can tell from the background of your of your house that you have small children. Yes, right? small child. Well, but yes, one. <laughs> uh, small child. I did, too, eventually. And, you know, it, it's hard, as you know, to to, you know, they're, they're very demanding. I was lucky enough that my wife was at home looking after them. But it was like I couldn't come home and say, hey, honey, thanks for taking care of the kids for nine hours while I was at work. Now I'm going to go for a run. So just do it, you know. Yeah, yeah. Things things fell away, uh, and there were just, you know, it seems like there were always something else I needed to do. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I gained weight, I got out of shape, but then, you know, I saw forty coming, and I got scared uh, of dying. Forty. I mean, right now that seems crazy, but the forty seemed impossibly old. And I just did what a lot of people do: is they said, "Well, all right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna fight mortality. I'm gonna, I'm gonna run a marathon." Mm-hmm. So I, I've never done it before. Signed up to run the. So that was the kick. You oh, signed absolutely. up for a marathon. That was I what got I said, you back. I'm gonna, I, I, I turned 40 in 2005. I signed up for the 2005 Chicago Marathon. Okay. I trained for it poorly, <laughs> and on my own, I broke all my own advice, which I now have come to understand. Um, and yet, I finished it in a lot of discomfort. But amazingly, much to my own surprise, I said to myself, I wonder if I could do that faster. Mm-hmm. And that started me on the journey I'm still on. I've run 14 marathons since then, some of them a lot faster, some of them a lot slower. You know, it really transformed my life. I became a columnist for Runner's World, now I'm an author of a running book, mm-hmm. you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, the ultimate, yeah. Yeah, well, uh, the ultimate, but I'm up there. <laughs> so you mentioned, you know, having having kids, young kids, obviously a part of it is is going to be that, that they don't really care what your plans are, what your hopes are. They just want what they want at the time. Yes. But now you must still have a busy schedule. So for those listening who also have a busy schedule, how do you manage to fit it in? And from what I've read, as we discussed, your Wikipedia is correct. You run at least five miles a day. So how do you manage to squeeze it in now? I try. <laughs> uh, it's tough. You know, uh, I well, you know, obviously my kids are no longer young um, and I don't live with them anymore. So that, that's not an obstacle. Um, but I just I just get it done. Uh, I wish it was five miles every day. I, I, I sometimes don't manage it, but I try to run at least 25 miles a week more if I'm training. Mm hmm. And you just, you just, I mean, it's like this. It's like somebody says to you, well, you're very busy. How do you manage to eat? And your response is, well, you got to eat, right? Mm-hmm. So, you know, I'll, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll eat lunch at my desk or whatever. So it's like that. You're very busy. How do you manage a run? Well, if I, I just manage it because I have to. Yeah. So does that involve early mornings or late It night involves runs? early mornings. It involves sometimes evenings. Uh, it involves, you know, fitting it in whatever I can. Sometimes, for example, you know, I'll quit work a little early and go for a run on the lakefront, uh, take a shower in the gym at the office and then head home. Sometimes I'll go in late. Sometimes I'll just get up really early. Later today, I'll probably, you know, we're going to do some Memorial Day stuff and then I'll probably come home and in the afternoon, I'll take my dogs for a run. I also have these pair of dogs that love running. So mm, they, if, even, even on a day when I'm like, ah, I don't feel like it, they're like, let's go, let's go, let's go. So I'd imagine even if, even if you didn't plan on running and didn't want to run, they would be uh, climbing the walls if you didn't. Yes, exactly. Out anyway, so you need you need to get them out either way. Yeah. Uh, okay, that's great. So let's talk about just a few other running things for the future. Is you've done three of them? Three, I think. Yeah, of the world marathon majors is Chicago, New York, Boston. Yeah. yeah, I'm 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 actually you know my days of running marathons very quickly are over. Mm-hmm. However, I'm I'm really I, I've decided to start I guess marathon tourism. Yep. Just go to interesting places and run a marathon there. So last month I did the Big Sur Marathon, mm, which is beautiful. astonishing. No, it really, it lives up to the hype. It is the most beautiful marathon. I can't imagine a more beautiful one because so, you're out there in the coast. In addition to beauty, I've heard someone say it's the best smelling marathon. Oh, is that right? yeah, it's, it's fantastic. I mean, you're just out there in the ocean. Mm. And I don't, have you ever seen Big Sur? No. No, oh, it's astonishing. It's the most beautiful coastline. If there's a more beautiful coastline in the world, I don't know about it. Okay. And one of the great things about it is that it's undeveloped. Mm. And I remember saying to somebody before I ran it, I was like, oh, you know, I love New York because New York has crowds the whole way. And they were like, oh, we don't have any. 
And the reason they don't have any is because it takes place almost entirely through public or, or undeveloped land. There's nobody who lives out there. Mm. But you get to run through this landscape. Just you, the other runners, every mile there's people giving you a, uh, you know, some, some liquid refreshment. And that's it. And it is really stunning. And then later this year, I'm going to go to Maui and run a marathon there. Mm. So yes, I would love to you know, run London and Berlin. I'd love to run uh, Paris. I'd love to run you know, the Loire Valley Marathon. I'd love to run the, you know, I'd love to run the Havana Marathon. And as long as my wife is um, patient with me, I'll be able to do those things. <laughs> Great, cool. Well, I look forward to hearing you, hearing the uh, write-ups and recaps of those. Now, the another thing you've done, which is just really cool, and actually you ran as a guide for- I did. Um, a few uh, blind runners in your in different marathons. Why go that route and do that? Oh, that was you know, and I hope to do it again too. Um, this last marathon, uh, the Big Sur, was the first marathon I've run for myself, i.e., not as a guide, since 2011. Mm -hmm. What happened to me? I mean, it's, I tell the story in my book, but very briefly put. I trained to and ran a PR marathon. I really intended to do that. I was like, I'm going to see if I can set a PR, which had been 320. I trained very hard, and I ran a 309 in 2011. And I felt very good about that. But I weirdly also felt like I had run out of motivation. I mean, I, I didn't want to put in the extra effort to get under three. I was getting older, and it was hard enough to get to 309. So what are you going to do now, you know? And uh, I was in that mindset when I got a call and was invited to guide a runner at Boston. And that's what I was doing at Boston in 2013. I was guiding a runner named William Greer, a blind runner. And I found that extremely gratifying and providing me that motivation that had you know, somewhat gone away from me. That, uh, so I wasn't that interested in running them for my own sake anymore. Mm -hmm. But uh, man, it was really gratifying and almost important to try to run it for the benefit of somebody else. In this case, this blind runner who wanted to run Boston for the first time and wanted a guide. And I was like, all right, I will be there for you. And I've done that four times and it's always extraordinarily gratifying. And, um, and one of the things I've said to people is if you're feeling bad, because this invitation came in the worst of my own personal crisis, if you're feeling bad, one of the best things you can do is go out and help somebody else. And one of the best ways to do that is in person, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. I mean, yes, we all donate money. We, we spread messages, oh, donate, you know, on Twitter or whatever. And those are important things. But if you can like, if you can like help a blind person run a marathon or read a book to them or, uh, take a disabled person shopping or anything, um, you will feel so much better. It's like, it's like a shot of dopamine to your brain just to be generous in person. So I, I've, I've done it. I recommend it. And like everybody else, I should do it more. Absolutely. Did you do that for United in Stride? No, I did it. The first three times was for a team with a vision, which is the athletic arm of Massachusetts Institute for the Blind and Visually Impaired. Okay. And the fourth time I did it for Achilles International in New York. Okay. I will put links to both of those and United in Stride um, in the show notes for anyone if you are interested in those. All right. So let's talk about your book, The Incomplete Book of Running. Now, for those who don't know what the, the name for that is kind of a spinoff about, tell us why that name. When I grew up and started to run in the 1970s, the, the big book, the book that everybody had on their shelf, was called The Complete Book of Running by Jim Fix. And it's hard to describe how important that book was, just in the same way that we old people like to say to you young people, well, when I was a boy, we only had three TV channels and we liked it. Similarly, it seemed easier in those days for one book to become massive, that everybody was reading this book. and this book played a huge role in the big 70s running boom. Uh, a lot of way people understand what that was like is to see the movie Forrest Gump, mm. in which Forrest Gump is credited with started this running boom. Well, he didn't exist. If there was any person who really did it, it was this guy named Jim Fix. And he was an evangelist. He had been, as he would tell you, an overweight smoker who liked to play tennis, and he couldn't get across the tennis court without gasping. So somebody said, you should try running. He tried running. He lost 50 pounds. He, his health improved. And he wrote this book saying, all you need to do is go running, and 
your life will be better in immeasurable ways. In fact, every chapter was about, you know, your, your, your health will get better. Your mood will get better. Your sex life will get better. You'll be able to eat more food and not get fat. It was like this amazing, like the secret to life is running. Mm. And what people may not know that prior to that, and of course there were exceptions, nobody ran for exercise. The only people who ran were runners, right? I.e. people who were training to run 1,500 meters, 2,000 meters, 1,000 meters, or people who were training for other sports, right? You know, there, there's the classic image of like Muhammad Ali out there doing road work. And the idea is you're conditioning for some other sport. So the idea of just running for its own sake, just going out and running five miles, not because you were going to race five miles or not because you were training to get in shape to box or we'll do anything else, was entirely new or at least new to most people. And that's what started it all. Mm -hmm. It was a huge influence on me. I remember before I ever started running, reading that book and looking at the illustrations of happy, skinny people, I was neither and wanted to be both. And so when I came to write my own book, uh, I really, I, I wanted to pay tribute to that. Mm. I also wanted to contrast myself to it because, uh, I, you know, his book is about how running brings you joy in every regard. And it's an entirely positive depiction of running. And my book is a little less, uh, <laughs> a little less cheerful, although hopefully funny. And so I wanted to contrast it. It's, yep. His book is a work of an evangelist. My book is a work of a convert. And, and converts like me understand some of the problems with what we've converted to, what we took on mm -hmm. when we made that conversion. Great. Okay. Well, that you kind of explained what the book is about there as well. But have you ever met Jim? No. You see, this is what happened. Jim became very famous mm -hmm. as this evangelist of running. He, in fact, he, his, he ended up writing a second book, a sequel, the second complete book of running, which he felt self-conscious about. And he became such a celebrity uh, that he actually wrote a third book called Jackpot, which was about, oh my God, I was this middle-aged editor in Manhattan, and now I'm this nationally famous person. This is amazing. So he became very, very famous. Then, at the age of 53, he went out for a run, his daily 10 miles, and he had a massive heart attack and died right there in the side of the road, wow. which was a big shock yeah. to those of us. A lot of people who at that time were like, running, it's bad for you. Mm -hmm. I, they said, see, see what happens. Yeah. Now, as it turns out, he had a um, genetic cardio, cardio flaw, something that he had inherited from his own father who died young of a heart attack. And for all his emphasis on health and well-being, apparently, and I know this from talking to a friend of his, he never went to the doctor. Mm. Uh, so if he had, maybe, even with the technology of the day, they could have said, you know, you've got this serious problem that's going to kill you soon. Yeah. But uh, he never did. And so thus died. Uh, I have, however, corresponded with his son, who is a uh, he, he's the head of a school in Connecticut, and his son is both appreciative of what I've had to say about uh, Jim in my own writing and his father, that is. And I think he likes my own book as well and understands that it's an homage. That's great. Well, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Obviously not happy to hear about Jim, but at least you've managed to have some kind of um, relationship with his son and kind yeah. of can keep talking about him and, uh, you know, what an impact he had. Now, you mentioned that the book is kind of... Uh, some of the not so good things. And uh, in yeah. one of the summaries for your book, and as again, I apologize for not reading it, but I will after this, um, you talk about quieting down your colon. So yes. I would like to know if that's what I think you're referring to. Yes, How it is. How successful was your tactic of quieting down your colon when in my community, we call it code brown. So Not, um, much. not I, much. One of the things that happened to me, I never had that problem. Uh -huh. And then uh, in 2010, I was hit by a car while riding my bicycle. I was training for a triathlon. And uh, I was injured. They didn't have to do surgery, but I was in pain, so they gave me morphine. And as I'm sure you know, morphine, opioids, uh, have a very poor effect on the digestive system. Mm -hmm. They basically paralyze it. Oh, I did not know that. Wow. Yes, in fact, one of the weird things about this dystopia we live in is you can see ads for laxatives that are specifically for opioid-induced constipation. Hmm. Well, you asked. So all of a sudden, I was having problems that I had not had before, and they've persisted to this day. So it just, you know, I write about it in my book. You told me that Dean Carnes has told you a story uh, about an olive tree. 
I have a similar story in my book. It was, uh, it was a, um, in my case, it, the, the, it's a bush, but yeah, this has been something I've been wrestling with for a while. Uh, and it's just part of the, it's part of the deal. Uh, basically these days, what I've discovered, uh, is that I ha and this is a pain, but I have to get up an hour earlier mm -hmm. for my morning run just to get, uh, have a cup of coffee and, you know, get the juices flowing yep. as it, and that seems to help a lot. Although it's, you know, I also have, as I describe in the book, a very complete mental map of my local community of where to find available restrooms. Uh -huh. And, you know, whenever there's a new construction project and they put out a porta potty, my friends and I note it, Yeah, yep. you know, put it in the mental map. You better be careful though, if you do go to London, because England is, I mean, I've been on that countless runs and it might be a, like, especially on a Sunday, but any time really, um, I, I mean, over here, a lot of places are open 24 hours a day or there's things, you know, around, but in England, there are, you know, I could be miles away from, from anywhere where I could go to the bathroom and it is terrifying when that happens. So you better watch out if you do go to London, I shall. make sure you re research that because a lot yeah, of the I, restaurants kind of like New York and stuff, it says no public restrooms, you know, oh, all I that know. kind of stuff. So it's tricky. I, there's a, there's a, I was in, last time I was in London was the end of 2012. Mm -hmm. And, um, I, there's a McDonald's in the South bank for which I apologize because I just, I, I strode right in by that, you know, restrooms for customers only. And, uh, did they have a key or thankfully it was one? I don't remember. All I remember is that it was a successful mission. That's all I remember. So <laughs> London, South Bank, McDonald's, thank you very much. Besides, okay. I'm an American. Don't Americans have rights to go into any McDonald's we want? Uh, I, I guess. <laughs> if you say so. All right. So I just have four more questions for you. Um, just sure. some we wrap up with every time. One piece of advice you'd like to give the listeners for life? Uh, one piece of advice. All right. Don't judge yourself by others. Mm, I think that something about our culture is so intent, and this goes back to body image, but there's so many other things. One of the things about our culture that's kind of poisonous right now is that we're constantly being presented with models of what your life should be. And that ranges from everything from, you know, the covers of athletic magazines. You could have abs like this or arms like that or a butt like that to Facebook to like, Oh, look, here I am with my wonderful family, having a wonderful time in a wonderful place. And the result of that is we're all sitting around looking, saying, well, my abs don't look like that. Or I didn't, my last vacation wasn't anything like that. And I'm not getting along with my son or daughter or father like they are. Yeah. And if you start comparing yourself to that, you're never going to get anywhere because you're never, you're never going to have abs that look like that. You're never going to have that kind of relationship with the people in your life if your relationship is different to begin with. Well, and you're then looking at your phone rather than actually being with them. <laughs> exactly. That's also <laughs> true. But, but more to the point, the one thing you need to know as well is those people are probably putting on their best front. Yeah. One of the things I have found out being open, even to the extent I have been about my own troubles is that a lot of times people will respond by saying, you know, something similar is going on in my life, or I had the same problem, or let me tell you about what's going on with me. And what you find out is everybody is struggling with things. Yes. That person who has fabulous abs on the cover of the magazine might be, you know, as you say, maybe it's this gorgeous woman and she looks incredible and muscular, but it turns out that woman, as you say, haven't, hasn't had her period for five years because yes. she's starving uh, one of my friends uh, is an elite runner, a former elite runner who who missed a year because of her eating disorder. I mean, people, everybody is walking around with burdens. Yeah. And you shouldn't feel bad because it seems like yours are worse than everybody else's and you're never going to get to where they are because they're not where they are. Mm -hmm. I know this has turned into a little speech as opposed to one line, but in everybody's emphasis when it comes to running or self-improvement is to try to be the best versions of themselves that's practical to attain. Mm -hmm. uh, and that may be, you're never going to look like that cover model. You're never going to have that kind of relationship. You're never going to do this, but you could do something that's better and healthier for you right now and focus on that. So true. I love that. That is, and I'm glad you kind of expanded on it because I think everything you said there is very important to, to mention and bring up. And it's a reoccurring topic we have on this show, which I like because it keeps reminding us of that again and again. 
Now, on that note, uh, this, you know, someone who you do recommend someone follows on social media, one person to follow on social media who is maybe a positive example, is kind of, you know, letting down their guard and, and showing the other side of things. Uh, I'm going to, geez, that's tough. I mean, you asked me, I, I, I knew I had to answer that question. Uh, the people I follow on Twitter, and uh, I'm not only on Twitter, I don't do Instagram. They're, they tend to be people who have either are funny in a way that I'm not and make me laugh. People who know things that I don't, uh, experts, journalists. And there are a few people who I follow just because I like being led into their lives. Mm. And although there are a lot of wonderful people I follow on Twitter in, in, in what you just gave me as, as the frame, I would have to say it would be Nicole cliff. Okay. Nicole is, she's on and off Twitter. She's on right now. But she's she's a social media influencer. Apparently, she's well known for this. But she's wonderful because she she talks very honestly and, and in a kind in a really fun way about her life. She lives with her husband in Utah about the things that she does, her travels, her struggles. She's incredibly open. I know things about Nicole that I don't know about my wife <laughs> uh, in terms of like what she's done or intimate her intimate life. But she does it in a way. And I don't know how it's a kind of just magic pixie dust that she has. She does it in a way that's welcoming and funny and inclusive. And every now and then she has this amazing gift for saying, okay, here's like something, uh, I'll make something up. Like here's something really stupid I did in pursuit of a guy I was interested in say, tell me your story. And what will then happen is hundreds of people will chime in with their own stories. So, and, and, and maybe it's a woman who did something for a guy. Maybe it's a gay man who did something for a guy. Maybe it's a guy who did something stupid for a woman. And so what happens is this is a very funny, confessional community mm. of people talking about their mistakes, their flaws, their anecdotes, their great stories. And it, it ends up being kind of like a, a wonderful online community just focused around Nicole and her own honesty and humor. And it, I find it great. I've, like I've, that. I've chimed in many times, uh, to her stories. Great. Thank you. I will definitely put a link. That sounds really good for all of us to go follow. Sorry. Were you going to say something else? No, no, I just, I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of hers. One of the, I've, and it's fun. I consider her a friend of mine because we communicated a lot. I've never met her. I hope to someday. She seems really nice. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think most of us nowadays have a lot of friends who we um, yeah. have never met. Actually, Tom Foreman, who introduced you and I, um, I only met him in person for the first time probably a few months ago. And it was just, it, it you know, it, we slotted straight into this friendship that we've built, but it, it was nice to actually do it in person. Mm -hmm. So it always is nice to meet someone that you've come to know yeah. over the years. So Social media is not entirely pointless. Yes, absolutely. All right. How do you want to be remembered on this show? How do I want to be remembered on this show, on your show, mm -hmm. or in life? Well, it used to be, how do you want to be remembered in life? But I think people thought I was being quite morbid. So oh, now I, I say on the show. So you can take it the other way if you want to. You know, I, I, again, with me, this often happens, but it turns into a little monologue. But I'll try to keep it brief. <laughs> okay. I used to, when I was a younger man and a more ambitious man, a more arrogant man, used to want to make an impact. And I wanted to be admired for my skill. I wanted to be famed for my ability. I wanted to be envied for my position. I'm older and wiser now. And these days, what I want to be known for, and what I genuinely try to do every day, I can't say if I succeed every day, but I try, is I want to be remembered and thought of as somebody who made other people's lives a little bit better if only for a moment, mm -hmm. uh, because I put on a radio show that they found amusing, or I wrote a book that they enjoyed or got something from, or on a more, you know, convivial level, I made them a meal that they liked. I, I mean, I really do think, and, and uh, this sadly had to come to me in the wisdom of age, that the only really good thing you can do here on this planet while we're here is to try to make a, a, other people's lives just a tad easier mm -hmm. to the extent that you can, when you can. And that's a, you know, that's a big thing, you know, for a guy who mainly, mainly tells fart jokes on the radio. <laughs> well, but I definitely think you have succeeded in doing that. So that that, will... that's, you know, and, and that's really all I care about yeah. these days. Uh, and mainly because I'm too old to worry about all the other stuff. I am who I am, you know? Yeah. Well, that's good. That's kind of how we all want to get to eventually. All right. And then finally, share with us a running for real moment. You told us about using McDonald's in, in London. 
but anything that only runners will understand, you know, something funny or something um, just different that only runners will get. Uh, when you finish a run and you chat with people, uh, this will be, I think it'll be particular to male runners and you chat with people and you say goodbye, maybe even you sit down for a cup of coffee and you get home and you realize that the entire front of your singlet is covered with blood because your nipples have been bleeding for the last five miles. Yep. I, I don't know that one, but I have definitely seen a lot of men experience that and uh, it doesn't look fun. But No, um, it's terrible. Yeah. It's, I, I would imagine the shower is pretty painful after Oh, that. it's the worst. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no. we get, women get a lot more, I think, thigh chafing and that, that yeah. burns, but... Uh, I could imagine to getting to the point where it bleeds down your body, that that's pretty painful when you get in the shower. All yes. right, Peter, thank you so much for joining us today. How can people find out more about you? And, you know, we mentioned your book, Incomplete Book, book of Running. We've mentioned your Twitter. Are those the two main places yeah, other than really, obviously the podcast? I mean, I, I used to try to hold have a personal website, but I couldn't keep that up. Anybody who wants to know anything about me or certainly how to find my book or to see what I'm up to should just go to my Twitter account. It's at Peter Sagal, which is spelled P-E-T-E-R-S-A-G-A-L. Okay. Uh, or, or you can find me through uh, NPR's website by going, searching Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. You'll find a page about me and that'll link to my uh, Twitter account as well. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much for giving us your time, for sharing your insights with us. We appreciate you and all that you've done. Thank you for making the world a better place. Thank you so much for having me. My friends, if you have a minute and you could leave a review on your favorite podcast player, Apple Podcasts, PA, iTunes, Stitcher, Overcast, Pocket Class, Spotify, or whatever else podcast player you use to listen to this podcast, or if you would subscribe to this podcast, you will help me get out in front of new runners to make our tribe even bigger and even better. It might not seem like you as one person can make a difference, but really it helps a lot. And it shows me you appreciate the hard work I put in for those. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for listening to that episode of the Running For Your Podcast with Peter Sagel. I know many of you have been wanting to hear from him for many years now. You've been asking me about it every time I ask who you want me to have on the podcast. And I've tried. I really did try for many years to get him on, but... It took a mutual friend to introduce us and I'm so thankful that happened because what a guest he was, what a guy and I'm just so grateful that the running world is filled with so many wonderful people and and so many people we can learn from in different ways. That was just a fascinating uh, episode and I talked to Pete a bit afterwards about a future episode where he introduced me to a different friend of his who I might actually have on in another episode. So stay tuned for that one. And I just want to take a moment to thank any of you and all of you who have gone to the sponsors of the Running For Your Podcast, be it this week through Athletic Greens and MetPro, be it through other weeks through Body Health, through Generation You Can through Aftershocks, any of the brands that I've been working with lately, I just want to send you a huge thank you for going to those product websites, purchasing their products through my link. That gives a massive thumbs up to me. I mentioned it in the mental training week, how much that helps me, but you're going to get those, uh, you know, something especially that you would be considering or using in your daily life, knowing that you went through my link, that gives me a massive thumbs up. So thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. You allow me to keep doing this. As you know, a podcast is a free product, but having the ad sponsors on there mean that this can be part of my career, part of my livelihood. So thank you for the support. Now, next week, we are going to turn to the environmental impact. This is an episode I've been thinking about for a while. And there was one girl I knew I wanted, but she's uh, <laughs> working so hard trying to get the uh, world to change, really, to make a difference um, in the world with it regards to the environmental part of our lives. And uh, Claire Gallagher is going to be on the show next week. She is an environmentalist. She is a very impressive trail runner with a lot of accolades next to her name, ones you will recognize, but she is very passionate about the environment. And I'm looking forward for us all to learn tips and tricks on how we can be better, how we can look after this world that we live in. And if you haven't already subscribed, go subscribe so you can get that one straight to you. This is such an important episode. So thank you so much and have a wonderful week. Thanks for listening to the Running For Real podcast. Be sure to check out TinaMuir.com for show notes and even more helpful running information.